And that continuing attack on the way universities are financed and managed and administered is a widespread phenomenon that makes me as gloomy or gloomier than many of the things we heard earlier in the day. I think it's animating dynamics, privatization, financialization, and militarization are to be found almost anywhere in the overdeveloped world. And in my 20 minutes, I think what I would like to do is to try and bring a kind of global context back to try and recover something of the world which, uh, from where I was sitting, seemed to recede a little bit in the conversations uh, we were just having a moment ago. Um, yes, those tendencies and patterns are found almost everywhere in the overdeveloped world and actually in many places outside it too. I think if you buy too quickly into a clash of civilization story, it's very easy to forget that the people who run Iran are also hostage to that uh, uh, neoliberal norms uh, as well. Okay, for example. Well, recent remarks by the CEO of Google, uh, was also, who's also a major advocate of EDX, a for-profit provider of education, suggest that these developments could be connected to the emergence of some novel varieties of capitalism that are inclined to see tertiary education as a luxury uh, or as a corporate opportunity, as a social rather than educational benefit. Uh, Eric Schmidt says they'll make good people, but as Wendy Brown pointed out earlier on, those people will require further local training if they're going to be able to serve corporate culture in appropriate ways. And that training is often in the form, of course, of the MBA. Although it's been my curse and my opportunity to turn up before you today, the day after England's first um, intervention in the MOOC world, a consortium of our leading universities, we were told, are going to be offering courses such as Muslims in Britain, Changes and Challenges, and the Causes of War, uh, in four hour uh, per week sessions over a four week period. And the obscenity of that is something that troubles me very much because from where I sit, it seeks to reduce the experience of being educated. Uh, I don't know if I've seen them here, but to these the supermarket experiences when one checks out one's own groceries, um, that's what education is destined to be. Um, Eric Schmidt, let me just quote him here. Colleges and universities are indecisive, slow-moving, and vulnerable to losing their best teachers to the internet. So the best of you, that's your fate. Colleges have been, I'm quoting again, uh, uh, the luxury, colleges have, sorry, the luxury of democratic deliberation of issues because they never actually do anything. I think this was said at Princeton. I don't know if uh, Joan Scott was in the audience at the time. Anyway. Um, I suppose I think the way in which those different phenomena are connected but also unevenly developed in um, uh, a complex knotted formation of anti-intellectualism, uh, privatization and, uh, uh, and uh, um, another phenomena of that, the way they're connected together but also very unevenly developed means it's very, very important to be clear about exactly from where one speaks. And I know that we know that Europa was the daughter of a Phoenician. Um, uh, but uh, not every part of Europe enjoys the same historic relationship to the development of humanism that you find in this august institution. And uh, not everyone is, not every university is, um, is, is as close to the stories that we tell, the um, Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment story, or the uh, story of how uh, Italian humanism uh, marches on through the years, of course, omitting the sorts of things that George MacDesey wrote about in his account of how that humanism was connected to, uh, to patterns of life and scholarship and institutional pursuit of knowledge in the, in the Arab world. Anyway, all of that seems to me to mean that we should be very careful about how we, uh, where we position ourselves and, and to think, as the title, a post-colonial university question mark, suggests about the politics of location in all of this. And there is a very specific EU context which should not, I think, be erased by the importation of North American concerns. I was very struck by the wire and the wisdom, the gnomic wisdom of Derek Bock and other touchstones of that experience um, and I suppose the recurrence of that, um, reaching for that or groping in that direction, seemed to me to suggest that part of what's at stake in our conversation, perhaps we can discuss this, is something um, that's not unconnected with the status of the United States as the planet's, for the moment anyway, dominant intellectual power. Now, we speak a lot of about, about American military power, a lot about American financial power. 
Uh, but we don't always talk about American intellectual power, and I think we have to uh, bring that into our conversation about the politics of location. Um, and I think there are various metrics, uh, matrix, uh, metrics for thinking about this question, um, but I, 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 I just want to put it up there, uh, whether we count, you know, uh, how we count human and cultural capital, startups, patents, PhDs awarded, um, and questions of sponsorship and, uh, and, and so on. Um, now, I raise that because recently there have been a number of developments in the humanities and social science that suggest or attempt to articulate a kind of new geography for thinking these relations of power and knowledge globally. And often that the language, which incidentally hasn't come up, I think, very, very strongly today, is a language of the North and the South, an attempt to construct a different political geography than the one we knew from the Cold War era. Uh, an attempt to uh, articulate a politics of location uh, recognized as a global struggle over knowledge and ignorance associated with the intervention of the Komarovs of Raywin Connell in Australia, um, and, and I think also of Ulrich Beck who came here as part of the program of the Treaty of Utrecht Visitors. I, my view of that work, and I'm glad in some ways that people are pursuing this line of argument, but I'm not sure yet that it's reached any further than the rich archive of the decolonization movements in the middle of the 20th century themselves have done. And it hasn't always, I think, been mindful in its translation into an academic discourse of the depth and complexity of that archive. So my question, a post-colonial university, post university names a problem it can't solve. And that problem really can be distilled into this. How and under what conditions does the overdeveloped world join the rest of the planet? What responsibility is to be borne for the fact that life inside the fortifications of overdevelopment is created by and still depends upon war, exploitation, misery, and privation outside that boundary? What sort of story are we going to tell about Europe, in this case, and its intellectual traditions when we cease to overlook Europe's colonial crimes and uh, rise to the challenge that was set out, articulated by Fanon at the end of The Wretched of the Earth, where he speaks about the, uh, the necessity in Europe's interest and in the interest of the liberation movements of devising a new humanism, a successor humanism, which will not overlook or repeat Europe's crimes. Now, I speak from uh, Britain, which, despite its intense and ongoing conflicts, does, on some hotly disputed level, seem to accept the post-colonial aspect of its present situation, even if that acknowledgement hasn't always been accepted by its political class, who do remain strongly wedded to the idea that the fading country must stay at the heart of world events, supposedly sitting at top tables punching above our weight. And that should not in any way be heard to be uh, me saying that everything is therefore all right in the United Kingdom, far from it. But I do think that basic acceptance that we inhabit a post-colonial moment, that we are in fact a country which has enjoyed a colonial past, that principal evidence being the strangers and aliens who are now within our gates, that realization generates its own pathology, but it's obviously not shared across uh, Europe where angry denial, refusal, and ignorance are much more typical. I haven't had time to pass up by the um, town hall to see if my friend Red Saunders' giant uh, mural of the signature of the Treaty of Utrecht is still on the outside of the building. Um, uh, 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 so I hope it is still there, but I do recall uh, on one visit here um, hearing that the reaction, overhearing the reaction of some passers-by staring, craning their necks to look up at the unlit limit the unlit image, because the money ran out before the lighting was installed, um, who, who wanted to, who could not grasp the idea that black people were included in that story. So I think I, I can use that as a, a, a little bit of a local example of how this process of decolonization that's required by our post-colonial predicament is still far from complete. Amnesia and erasure are norms, political, economic, juridical, governmental, and effective dimensions of decolonization have not been synchronized. And that patterned forgetfulness is not something abstract, as was shown, I think, also by some of the local reactions to the suggestion that the asiento in the Treaty of Utrecht might be a legitimate part of how the treaty was going to be remembered after 300 years. What can one say about the empire in a high school 
uh, curriculum assumes a certain configuration in the French setting or in the Japanese one where the Koreans and the Manchurians supposedly volunteered themselves into submission. Um, but in the United Kingdom, where our government has appointed Neil Ferguson in charge of reforming the secondary uh, school history syllabus, things are a little bit different. Um, I don't know if he's still involved with your, uh, 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 your most distinguished uh, uh, um, sometime citizen, but you know, I mention it partly in the hope that, that that relationship is still alive and that might be used to qualify not only the relationship of Eros and Logos, but of the, um, of the uh, uh, uneven development that I've been speaking about so far. Anyway, we are in effect required to set aside critical perspectives as a condition of our communion in Britain as a nation, and Neil Ferguson, public intellectual preeminent, is going to, um, is going to oversee that process. So the belligerent civilizationist froth offered up by Ferguson is a useful reminder that the ongoing and apparently endless wars we are in are the context for these calculations about the relationship with the past and the present and perhaps also the future. Though the loss of futurity, the loss of historicity are also strongly characteristic of this time that have been exploited by the warmongers and the civilizationists. Someone earlier on, um, I, I think it... Uh, uh, I think, it, I don't recall exactly who it was, m mentioned Twitter. And I've lately taken to following uh, Hirt Wilder's Twitter feed. I don't know if you've been following it. Uh, I've been uh, particularly interested coming back to Utrecht because I thought you'd all be in a, in a lather about the, the monster mosque which is being erected locally. I don't know if anyone's got strong views about that. Um, but I do imagine that something like that controversy, something like that discussion is one that might be usefully, usefully interrogated, brought into conflict with a different kind of story about the development of um, of humanism in uh, this part of the world, you know, whatever Nicholas Clenardus in the 16th century got from his study of Arabic might be a useful corrective to some of the, um, I don't know, I think I feel even more harsh about this than Wendy uh, Brown's politeness uh, um, 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 when the similar point came up. I, I think actually it's about a, a particular kind of ignorance. The word ignorance wasn't used. I think ignorance um, is something that's it, it's hard to avoid in this. And I, and I know that there have been historians of science who've begun to experiment with different ways of thinking about ignorance, talking not just about what one doesn't know, but about how ignorance might be reproduced over time institutionally, how spaces of ignorance are created, mediated, and managed uh, technologically. And there is a certain story about that in the 20th century, it seems to me, that takes us beyond the versions of that story that we might derive from reading Machiavelli or reading Foucault. Now, uh, rushing on, uh, lest you feel I'm being a little bit too loose in my invocation of colonial history, I want to emphasize that that European post-colonial predicament is open to everybody in, in Europe. If you look at the ISAF website, for example, you'll see that a number of countries, some of which have been very active in what I would call neo-colonial adventures, don't even recognize themselves in the description of being post-colonial, even as the reality of that implication in engulfs them, and I think the best example probably of that process will be the Danes, because they have lost proportionally, as I'm sure you know, more of their soldiers fighting uh, in these wars than uh, per capita than, than either the United States or the UK. Right, now I was going to say a little bit about the dimensions of our local educational crisis and the, um, um, the depths of it as a um, testing ground for the wider dissemination of neoliberal assumptions and norms. I just didn't want anyone who was here not to appreciate the, the extent of its dysfunctionality uh, and, the, and also the extent to which our neoliberal uh, implosion has taken education as a uh, way to acquaint people with the brutal realities that are coming at them in so many different directions. And there are a number of things to be said about this um, because the initial breakthrough the, for this, you know, um, was not from the right, let me emphasize, but from the Labour Party, the New Labour. Um, and it was um, done by Lord Brown. I don't know how much you know about him. He's the man who introduced our fee levels. He's the, he was known, actually, he was involved in a rather unsavory uh, court case, I won't go into it, in which his boyfriend explained that he was someone who would regularly spend £3,000 on a bottle of claret in an evening out drinking. 
So I'm not sure that the person who is responsible for calculating what is reasonable with regard to uh, the price of education is necessarily working with the same, uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure it's very nice and I can sympathize with the impulse, uh, but uh, I, I, I wonder if he's this is really a fit person to be appointed by, uh, by a left-wing government uh, to, uh, to judge these matters. So there's something to be said about Lord Brown. Um, but I won't, I won't go into that. And actually where BP fits into this story is also another very interesting question I haven't got time to go into. Anyway, I want to suggest that in this context, where information has become either data or content, both history and historicity have degenerated into a fitful flow of events with discrete backstories rather than uh, histories. Uh, new politics of education is being born. And that general waning of historicity that characterizes um, the, uh, uh, this moment uh, combines with what I've called in the past a post-colonial melancholia to set up some new challenges for the university in its role as an important institutional repository of historical knowledge. And that problem becomes especially acute with regard to formative effects of the colonial past because Ritz, perhaps more than other Europeans, although I think it'll be a close call if we start to test it empirically, suffer terribly from a deficit of historical knowledge when uh, that failure is exposed by neo-colonial circumstances. Okay, and there is a long overdue, in my view, process of working through our country's imperial legacy that remains obstructed. There's a kind of pathological blockage there uh, which offers its bewildered adherents something more than a powerful filter to be deployed against the things that make them uncomfortable or a way to challenge the guilty pleasure they derive from an imagined victimage at the hands of those that they themselves have victimized, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and other denizens among the citizens. The colonial and imperial archive then, much of it in the university, acquires a strategic as well as a historical importance. Apart from the direct challenge that its contents present to the myths of linear imperial progress and uplift, it affords a valuable point of entry into unmaking the psychosocial projections which present Britain's wonderful but triumphant anti-Nazi sacrifices so that they screen out and reshape all subsequent conflicts over decolonization. And this is particularly interesting, I think, with regard to the massive release of new historical documents in the context of the legal case um, brought in settlement of some 60-year-old abuses during the Kenyan emergency. Um, that is, the government lost these documents and they have now been found. Now, I would, I, again, one doesn't want to be detained by this, but a lot of people on the left were saying, this is proof that going through the courts is the answer. This is, uh, here we have this treasure trove of things that prove Europe's colonial crimes. Um, but I think it's not, in a sense, unconnected to the fact that in the prosecution of the war on terror, Kenya has become a base for, you, you may have noticed that the gentleman, that, um, who, um, the young man who, who um, uh, decapitated the soldier in London um, had been apprehended by some of our special forces soldiers in Kenya. And I think the settlement of this case is not unconnected to the idea that, uh, that the Kenyans require uh, a different sort of uh, geopolitical and juridical um, starting point for the latest uh, chapter in their relationship with our military excursions. Okay, now I mentioned that example not, not idly because it seems to me that the remaking of colonial relationships, the transformation of our relationships with places that have been colonial is also something that is not to be confined to um, is not to be confined to questions of, of university life, but has a broader, uh, broader political and uh, and um, um, governmental significance. Um, okay, now I would like to imagine, and I hope that uh, this is true, that a multinational constituency might be mobilised by the idea of working through those European histories of empire, in the political era characterised by cultures of weaponisation by the identification of its human terrain, the great importance of this historical opportunity is further than ever from being a narrowly scholastic affair. Anatomists of Europe's um, uh, colonial cultures committed to the interpretive power of the humanities and the social sciences must develop, I think, a range of critical apparatuses that can be deployed in, a larger, um, in the larger decolonizing conflict that's, uh, that's still unfolding around us. 
And that setting for our post-colonial inquiries into these issues is being shaped not only by the immediate effects of war, but also by the fact that any country, uh, that, uh, that any, um, I'm sorry, that in my country, the warrant for military action, which shadowed the world and ourselves, uh, and, showed, uh, and showed that world how great we could still be, that that warrant for military action has now been damaged, if not undone completely, by the results of going to war in Iraq against the wishes of the majority. Don't usually call it Iraq, actually. I usually call it Churchill's folly. That fracture has not healed and has decisively altered the ways in which Britain's sense of itself as a post-colonial entity is still being formed and lived. And those of us in education shouldn't reduce this post-colonial intervention to the more limited goals of making the culture of empire relevant where it has been repressed and recognizable where it's been ignored. Those steps are, of course, necessary, but they are, I think, insufficient. They have to be supplemented by ensuring that our unsympathetic retelling of the era of European universalism contributes to the making of a shared present, common to formerly colonized and formerly colonizing peoples and powers. And that, of course, is a more difficult task than I make it sound. However, the act of formally placing certain events and patterns and perspectives in the past can contribute directly to the integrity of what might be called a process of reparative resynchronization. That too is a delicate process, and I think it has to be distinguished from the voguish political appetite for what Tony Blair used to call in the easy jargon of management theory, drawing a line and moving on. Uh, I think it, it, but, but it does chime with an approach to post-colonial theory that I would want to associate with C.L.R. James' view of the development of, of black studies in the 60s and 70s when he was still living in Washington. He wrote an essay then called Black Studies in the Contemporary Student, where he said that black studies uh, in its diverse forms should not, he hoped, um, lapse into being a therapeutic or, or reparative practice alone, something addressed to the dignity uh, of, of those who, uh, who come to it for affirmation, but carried within it an alternative, the possibility of an alternative account of the development of Western civilization. And I think I want to associate the possibility of the post-colonial university with exactly that opportunity or an equivalent one. I think those post-colonial revisions are, are often perhaps illuminated by drawing on the idea that we might develop an atelic view of this process. Uh, it's not just about being in the same present, it's about seeking to, to uh, well, I suppose in, in the simplest form, um, revising the implicit imperial and colonial telos and, and arguing that what was thought to be the past might just turn out to be the future. And there is something in that, um, in some of the more interesting um, iterations of the prospect of theory from the, part, uh, theory from the South. Okay. Now, this becomes an urgent matter also because a marked feature of how our universities have responded to the crisis I began with has been the rush to establish campuses in formerly colonial locations, <laughs> as well as to establish themselves as educational providers in new, new settings, particularly India and China and the Gulf. And this strategy, let me emphasize, is not something that has been confined to uh, elite institutions. Every little institution in England will be setting up a campus either in India or in China or in the Gulf. Um, I mean, I was a little bit involved in the campaign to uh, defend the philosophy department at Middlesex University until that ran aground on the selfishness of the fugitive philosophers. And one of the things that I discovered while researching things I wanted to say in that kind of context was the extent to which the university had overstretched itself financially by building a massive new campus uh, in China. Okay, these are routine features. And I think there is a conversation to be had about the global politics of knowledge uh, um, which is relevant to this and to the internationalization of educational institutions. Time and time again, I've sat on boards and sat on um, appointments panels where our own students are actually not appointed because the jobs get given to US PhDs who've had three years longer to complete their work, uh, have had postdocs and so on. And this is a curious feature of the, I'm not, I don't want to sound nationalistic about it, uh, but I do think we need to have a, a kind of good map of where these processes actually intrude into our own practice as teachers and uh, university citizens. 
but that's not a contradiction in terms. Um, there is also on my list of things for our discussion a question about the impact of the neoliberal norms uh, that were spoken of earlier on the question of corporate multiculturalism. I don't know whether this is just something that comes from my experience of teaching at the London School of Economics, but it did, my time there did confirm to me that the end result of um, growth in higher education around the world has not been to produce some new um, uh, forces of um, cosmopolitan uh, variety necessarily, but to um, hold together a kind of multiracial transnational oligarchy, um, the, which is in some ways the basis of the uh, emergent imperial order uh, that we see around us. Um, and that many of the students who came to that institution, many of the students I taught there, were seeking a kind of affiliation or credentialization that would equip them for entry into this global master class. Well, against that, I think one ends up very often in defending a slow practice of contemplation at some point in the um, uh, transition of an elite pattern of higher education to a mass system of higher, sorry to use last century uh, terms, but when I went to university, I think seven or eight percent of the people who were equipped uh, to, to go uh, at the end of their secondary education went into higher education and now it's closer to 50%. So I think there are still arguments to be had about this and I don't want to sound like um, you know, um, some proper conservative with a capital C you know, who, who, who defends a version of the, of, the, um, of the institution that belongs to that era. I don't want to do that. But I do want to defend uh, certain features of, of, of the way the institutional um, habits of education were developed in that period. And I think the best way to do that, uh, again, drawing on things that Fanon has said that interest me very much as a beneficiary of it, as another, you know, uh, post-colonial person who likes reading Montesquieu or whatever it is. Um, I suppose what I want to, to say in particular is that I would want to defend the idea of curiosity as something that is endowed potentially with the kind of revolutionary force that he saw invested in it. And that curiosity is something that might extend infinitely in any direction. Okay, I had a little bit more to say about agnopolitics and about the ways in which ignorance becomes a new political norm. I was going to link this to a discussion of Wikipedia and the constructions of knowledge I don't know how you manage. I've just begun, I've just been made to, in my marking, do this all on a line on a screen. It's very tiring on the eyes. Um, and it's very interesting through the portal that that technology creates to think about the role of Wikipedia in organizing the kind of convergence of knowledge, the narrowing of knowledge. Um, and I would want to link that to this point I raised earlier on about the spaces of ignorance as matters of politics, and I was going to allude to the tobacco lobby and the historic significance of the tobacco lobby. Um, um, uh, uncertainty is our product as being part of that. I wanted to emphasize also that in risk society, the manipulation of scientific debate is a routine part of politics, and that corporate strategies for bombarding legal and regulatory bodies with dubious information designed to mystify and confuse to inhibit agency is also something we need to consider. Then I'll end by, um, by just returning you, pleading with you to go and look again at those closing sentences of the wretched of the earth, where Fanon speaks about starting the history of the human species inventing, imagining, and assembling new ways of being human um, in the context of a racialized scheme of geopolitics. I think, and this is where I differ from Rosie, that we have to return to that project. And that we should return to it not to burden the developmentally arrested world, if I can call it that, with the additional mission of having to redeem humanity with new conceptions of humanity, but to make what was once the third world and might now be the South count in determining what the future of humanity will be. In that sense, I want to walk in Fanon's footsteps where Sylvia Winter, who is his most, uh, I don't know what you call the person that immediately follows behind, perhaps with a, with a pail, you know, like behind the horse or something. Um, behind Fanon, Sylvia Winter describes that role and the returning to that question, that agenda as a work of re-enchantment. So with curiosity in my knapsack, I suppose I would say that that 
the work of re-enchantment belongs in the university and belongs in particular in the higher level study of the humanities, which are vital to that re-enchantment. And that involves engaging the university not as a cog in military and cultural diplomacy, but as a place of peace and a place where the, um, where the uh, imagination of planetary humanism might be allowed to proceed. Thank you. Paul, that was, that was really terrific. Um, and, and I think nobody has questions because we're overwhelmed with all of the possibilities of, of what you've given us to think about. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about curiosity mm. and the, the, the idea of curiosity needing, needing defense. And, and I, I sort of want to tie that to your uh, quote from the tobacco industry about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, because I take it in some ways, you were, you were referring to what I said this morning about doubt and uncertainty mm -hmm. as motives for uh, the pursuit of knowledge or, or education. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just wonder if, if mm -hmm. you could bring those into curiosity, uncertainty, mm -hmm. doubt could be, mm -hmm. you could say a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, this is, you know, this place has a certain relationship with the Cartesian legacy, doesn't it? So it's an, only an appropriate thing to say. Um, I was talking really uh, in the rush thing I said about uh, the, the, the tobacco industry. I was, I was talking about the instrumentalization of, of uncertainty. I mean, it may well be, you know, that, that, that the kind of curiosity I spoke of is connected to a, a, a version of the subject that I don't sort of inhabit th theoretically, um, but which, which corresponds to my experience of being educated. It may well be that, you know. I mean, you know, I went to university. I never went to any lectures at all, ever. I never went to one lecture, I don't, or maybe once I went to hear Sven Messaros or something, who was teaching at the university where I was an undergraduate. I never went to any lectures. I was in the library working. And, um, and I found that a very liberating possibility. So maybe I've generalized a little bit too, um, too, um, too um, peremptorily pr pr from that as a result of, of hurrying along. I, I, I think the question of uncertainty and its instrumentalization is connected to the, 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 the creation and uh, reproduction of spaces of, of ignorance and, and how those spaces are maintained. I think academics habitually look at ignorance, and I'm using that ugly word deliberately. Um, they, they look at it as if it's a, a vacuum into which truths can just be drawn automatically. And I think I'm, I'm trying to suggest that we need to think more carefully about that. We have had an, a sociology of knowledge, but we haven't always had a sociology of ignorance. And this is something that I think I would associate with some of the more creative things that historians of science have been doing, although often not aware, actually, of the political ramifications of this beyond the immediate context. I mean, Robert Proctor, who's done such wonderful work on the tobacco lobby as an expert witness and also as a historian, actually, on Nazi health and safety legislation and, and tobacco in Nazi Germany, is someone like that, I think, who releases very, very interesting conceptual work but is not interested in pursuing it as a matter of politics in unlocking the contemporary world. And I don't understand that inhibition, although I think it's got something to do with the formalization of fields and, 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 and so on, which is very characteristic of certain certain practice. Um, so curiosity, I, I suppose I think that Fanon said, what did he say? He said, oh my body, make of me a man who asks questions. So there's something about that curiosity for him which is already an embodied one. It's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't belong to the other Cartesian partner in which that curiosity sort of unfolds in a, in a line from purified processes of mental reflection that can be reduced to formulae. Uh, it's not an algorithmic curiosity, um, although actually algorithms, as we heard a moment ago, actually are the answer to that curiosity, because what means the, what, the way those algorithms function is that you never get a chance to be curious because you're always being presented with something that guides you step by step through the electronic window that you're in. Um, which is why I think I disagreed somewhat with some of the things that were being said in the last panel, because I actually don't want those algorithms to be the markers on the signposts of my curiosity. I, want, I, don't, I don't think I want any signposts at all, um, except the ones I put up, actually, on that journey. Um, I don't, is, that too cur is that too corny to speak of a, as a journey? And not only that, as a journey that one doesn't know the destination of in advance. I mean, that really is very an old school way of thinking about this. But that's, I guess that's how I see it, actually. It's a journey um, 
um, where you're, you're, you know, you're, you don't know your destination. With no roadmap. With no roadmap, that's exactly right. Uh, hello, Paul. Uh, Rolando Vasquez from... Nice to see you again. <laughs> yes. uh, I, just, I was wondering if you can expand a bit more on the notion of re-enchantment mm. and how this connects to, on the one hand, to include the knowledges from the Global South mm. uh, in the university, something that is not yet happening, and... Um, to include the consciousness of a shared present and how that consciousness requires the understanding of the colonial crimes and of a connected history, of a shared history. Mm -hmm. So how can we build re-enchantment through mm -hmm. a consciousness mm -hmm. building of mm -hmm. education, of shared histories, mm -hmm. of shared presence? So if you could expand a bit more on, on that, it would be lovely. Thank you. It's delightful to see you again. And I have a feeling it's not the first time you've asked me that question. <laughs> and, and I have a second feeling, which is that you already know the answer, as do I. And, and it relates to a conversation that you and I have had on, I think, two previous occasions <laughs> about Enrique Dussel. It's a really about how, I think, you know, about how, Dussel, for me, it, it was Dussel that was the revelatory source of this particular way of thinking one which, as we all know here, I'm sure, says that the phenomenology of I conquer precedes the phenomenology uh, of, of the cogito, okay? Um, how that, I think there is a shock in that discovery that is, um, you know, some of the more complacent versions of the humanities project are very well fortified against that, against that door being wrenched open. Um, Re-enchantment. Well, I suppose, I, for me, the word re-enchantment in Winter's mouth, you know, um, is, 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 is actually resonant because I think of re-enchantment as a kind of alternative to the disenchantment of the disenchantment, <laughs> which is, I think that's Rosie's field. I don't want to, to tread on her toes. But I, I think there's something, uh, there is perhaps something magical. To provoke you, then, I would say that it isn't just about um, encountering the cosmological uh, truths of other ways of social life, um, that the, the enchantment wouldn't be something that came, in a sense, from, from a, a magic that was imagined or projected there. But the enchantment would, would come really from, from the, the magic of unlocking the aridity of thought in institutions, uh, I won't say like this one, but like some of the other places I've worked, <laughs> where, where curiosity was not actually encouraged at all in the, in, the, in the classroom. And actually people were encouraged not only not to be curious, but to hide their curiosity as a condition of developing themselves as scholars in those environments. People were, you know, I think when I used to teach, I won't say places where I used to teach, I used to be, students were surprised when I expected them to actually read the book, you, you know, that I put on the list. They were used to cultivating a different set of skills, which was to do with um, filleting the book and usually, ideally, in the electronic version of the book so that you could search the book for key terms and write your account of the book on the basis of being able to move through any electronic text. So, um, so I think in, that, in the context of that kind of relationship to knowledge and, and information, and even perhaps to data, each of these terms needs to be interrogated carefully, the idea of holding a book, even a dusty one, that you found on the shelf next to the one you were looking for, might be thought of as an enchanting possibility. Is that too, um, too scrutinesque or whatever it is? I hope not. So um, uh, my job um, is to calibrate the time uh, and not in the reparative sense, but unfortunately in the somewhat punitive sense, uh, but of justice. So I want to say thank you very much. It may not be the case that there actually is a crisis of the humanities, but we do seem to spend a disproportionate amount of our time actually defending our existence. 
And I want to argue that this constitutive contradiction is one that reflects not only public concern about the relevance of our field, but also significant internal fractures within the humanities, fractures that cannot be mended just by good intentions, healthy self-confidence, or downright denial. I would like to look at some of those inner fractures in as normatively neutral a manner as possible, so provided that we agree that normative neutral is just another name for politically charged. I will not have ethics covering up issues of power, the political economy of knowledge productions, and who decides what counts as knowledge today, which, by the way, is the subtitle of the conference which I happen to be organizing with my other head. The general hypothesis I would like to de defend and which I've expanded at length in my latest book is that the humanities have a brilliant future, well beyond crisis and present predicament and contradictions, to the extent that they will show the ability and willingness to undergo a major process of transformation, to address two of their most distinctive and, in my opinion, limiting features. Firstly, methodological nationalism, and secondly, chronic anthropocentrism. We need to address these two issues in the light of changing geopolitical contexts and massive technological advances. We need schemes of thoughts and figurations, theoretical figurations, that enable us to account in productive, empowering terms for the changes and transformations underway. And of course, I can hear my colleague, the historian, saying the times have always been a changing. There's always been a change of transition. I can hear Bob saying, you remember Adam turning to Eve saying, darling, we live in age of transitions. Fine, but the extent to which we already live in ways in which our university work is not adequately representing, the extent, the gap between how we live and the kind of permanent states of transition, technical mediation, hybridization that we experience in our real life, the relationship between that and what we do in the classroom is a Grand Canyon type of gap that makes me extremely uneasy about the future of the field that I love so dearly. So to talk about globalization, technical mediation, the shift of geopolitical relations, and to talk about all of these technological advances does not mean that they are one linear event. They are internally split contradictory flows of transformations. They combine multiple timelines, and the need for synchronization is indeed enormous. They combine elements of ultra-modernity with splinters of neo-archaism. It is actually a very messy, zigzagging, <laughs> Yeah, there's a striptease going on. <laughs> the times there are changing. <laughs> the, the, the complexity of the, of the cartography of the present is so enormous that indeed we need a lot more creativity to deal with this. A caveat to begin with. Why should we care? And I think the question of the point of entry into this debate is of the greatest importance. Many of the speakers today uh, have echoed uh, some elements of my own genealogical um, story and my own theoretical pedigree. Um, Hank Osterling, Andy Brown, other people, Joan, uh, Scott. We come from generations of critical theory that has always kept a very healthy distance from the humanities as an institution in the sense that we have never stopped asking the question that my teacher Foucault taught me to ask, and the question is, what is the construction of the human at stake in the discipline that you are practicing. What is the human or the humanities? Are you that human? How human is human? How do we define that? I would want to argue that many of the differences that we have today along the internal fractures of the field of the humanities have not so much to do with the actual disciplines or our institutional politics, but with fundamental differences in the ways in which we conceptualize the human to begin with. And as we don't agree, we cannot possibly agree about what counts as the human, and then we cannot agree either on the criteria that we may use to define 
dehumanization, degradation of the human, threats and challenges to the human, let alone the legacies of humanism and anti-humanism, which would open alone, reopen the set chapters of the theory wars of the 1980s and 90s, where I'm sure nobody wants to go. But we need to acknowledge a multiplicity of points of entry into the debate itself, and in rescuing the humanities, or actually in denying that there is a crisis of the humanities, or in designing future scenarios with the humanities, we may be meaning or carrying or identifying radically different notions of what counts as the basic unique reference for that human in the practice of the humanities. So starting from my other head, the head of feminist theory, gender theory, had the honor of being the founding professor of women's studies in this distinguished university, I carry with me a whole tradition of feeling that my gender, the females of this species, were not quite full-time members of the human. The blacks and the non-Europeans were very part-time members of the human, so why do we care? And I would like to put this question that we do care for the very disciplines that we have been critically engaged with as one of the other constitutive contradictions of our era. It's one of the baby boomers' last calls, really, to try to account for what can only be put down as a actually a paradoxical almost contradiction. John Scott taught me that paradoxes are productive and useful things so long as you don't actually try to resolve them, just accept them and navigate them as splinters of contradiction for the year. This is not the least of our contradiction for many of us coming from post-structuralism, feminism, post-colonial race theory, that we actually want to rescue the very disciplines that fundamentally we've always been critical of. Now, what is that all about? And are the radicals, the Florence Nightingales of these dying institutions, are we going to bring the last breath of oxygen to a field that is actually gasping for air? Yes, we will, and I don't mind being the good girl and, and accepting their role, but not without acknowledging that it is a flagrant contradiction. And, uh, and that caring for that which has been at the source of our critical endeavors and is actually, for many of us, a crisis of the normative a political order that we acknowledge and we serenely sail through. If you look at the areas that um, have brought in this criticism of a certain notion of the human, women's studies, gender studies, post-colonial studies, they have in common one important feature that James Chandler has very astutely commented upon. They're all studies. They're not the traditional disciplines. Since the 1960s, clusters of nomadic knowledge production entities have emerged at the margins across the borders in the niches, in the uh, points of sort of lies, silence, and, and secrets and silence of the traditional disciplines, creating entire new epistemological and theoretical fields, which have proved immensely innovative, both theoretically and methodologies, methodologically, for the, what was to become the humanities. In common, a great deal of the critical studies areas uh, have had the critique of the vision of the human as a, a humanist entity which is at work within a European notion of the discipline of the humanities. So we have a humanist human within the humanities, that man measure of all things, which has been crit criticized for his, and it is a his, fake universalism for the exclusionary roles it plays in defining himself as much by what he includes and what is, as, as in what he excludes from the category of the human. That humanist man that is not only an, an ideal for the self and for community, but it is also a civilizational model that positions Europe not as a geopolitical area among others, but as the, a universal attribute of the human mind, Europe as the place where the power of transcendence and distinctive self-correctiveness of reason reaches historical implementation, Europe as a civilizational mission for the human spirit. That vision of the European man as the, the legacy of a certain notion of humanism with a package deal of attributes and a certain ideal of how reason and rationality implemented through scientific technological development can be at the heart 
over humanist education. That human, that man, has been called to task for the last 30 years, has been held accountable, not in any derogatory and cheaply nihilistic manner, but with great ethical tension, with great political concerns for what do we do when we uphold such a self-representation of ourselves as European humanists. What do you do when you claim that legacy? So this is at the heart of what I call the methodological nationalism of a great deal of the humanities across, across my continent, across the Europe, East, West, North, and South of the border. The extent to which they marry into a certain idea of Europe, and within that certain idea of Europe, regional variations that in, in any case make this part of the world the prototype for what human reason, human education, what pedagogical passions and missions we could export elsewhere. There is only really one university system, this one, and at the core of it, there's humanism. That's in a nutshell the target of the criticism, and around this, the studies areas, these critical studies areas of the last 30 years have not only been negative and critical, but we've also proposed very alternative visions of what counts as the human, emerging from the experiences of the other, those excluded others that are, of course, um, dialectically related to the man of reason as the parameters and the paradigm of all knowledge, truth, goodness, and self-correcting morality. So you get alternative vision of humanity coming from the most radical feminist text or from the sort of even the mild uh, feminist text. You certainly get different vision of humanity emerging from Fanon and the whole tradition of uh, non-Western humanism, of which Paul Gilroy is, in my eyes, um, the, the last living, the, the most alive of the living descendants. There are many other visions of what counts as the human in uh, the peace studies, in conflict studies, in environmental studies. There is a multi multitude of discourses about the human emerging from those critical epistemologies. It is not all relativism and nihilism. There are alternative worldviews. So for me, the legacy of those critical deconstructions of the man of humanism is not a university, it is a multiversity of ideas, and it's a multiversity that has offered resources that we need to enlist now to the task of redefining the humanities for the third millennium. So that is the point about methodological nationalism, a lot more to say but I need to use the time that I have to cover the second point, my favorite, which is anthropocentrism. To what an extent even the most radical critic of humanist humanism and of the human of humanism, the extent to which even the most radical feminist queer, you name it, post-colonial racial person, assumes somewhere along the line the centrality of our species, the centrality of Anthropos is one of the great questions of the day. That man, that human, is not only the representative of a dominant culture with a very healthy, narcissistic self-representation of itself as the measure of all things. That man is also Anthropos, the representative of a very aggressive, very dominant species that has made this planet the playground for his and her ambitious fantasies and desires. And it's a very complicated issue, the question of anthropocentrism, because it is a deeply irritating one to anybody who has been trained in social and political sciences. We come from healthy stock of social constructivism. We come from the idea that one becomes, one is not born a woman. We are feminine, not females. Um, there are, social constructivism is a filter through which we have had to read the world in order to defend our emancipatory politics. What happens if we had to reconsider that statement in the light of contemporary biogenetics? of contemporary neurosciences, of contemporary evolutionary theory, if we had to actually correct Simone de Beauvoir and say, sorry, buddy, a lot of this is actually born with. Um, uh, you know, um, actually we know, read Liz Gross, that sexual difference is written in the genes. Sorry, oops. Um, what happens, and this is the call that Deepresh Chakrabarti, the challenge that Chakrabarti throws to post-colonial theory. What happens if in looking at the climate, change um, uh, problems, if looking at the environmental crisis, yes, we do admit 
that there are incredible differences in the socioeconomic of carbon traces, that some cultures and traditions use up the world resources far more than others. That's all very well. So social history is all very well. However, buddies, the problem of climate change reconstitutes humanity as an endangered category, we have a pan-humanity emerging from the fact that we are in this together, no matter if I use 20% of the world resources and you use six times more. We are in this together. Humanity emerges as a category of vulnerability, wiping out, at least potentially, all other differences. So how is post-colonial theory going to survive the challenge of, of deep history? And Chakrabarty throws a real challenge to the historian saying, social history has no future. You need to marry into deep history. You need to think extinction. You need to think mutations. And are the disciplines of the social sciences actually uh, equipped to do so? It is a really major question. And Chakrabarty doesn't really give an answer, but I try to go a little bit further in my book, and strangely enough, after all I've been saying, I am not pessimistic at all. <laughs> strangely enough, my answer to Chakrabarty will be, but of course we can cope with this, but we can cope with this if we have the courage to shift some basic premises. And the basic premise, I suppose, I propose that we change is the idea of the human, not only as man, the measurable things, of all the humanist stuff, but also the idea of human as dominant anthropos. I propose that we shift to a post-human perspective and that we put it as an open hypothetical category, as a discursive tool that we can work with in order to address the great um, challenges of the day against the prophets of doom, I would like to experiment with posthuman humanities, to experiment with environmental humanities, biogenetic humanities, neural humanities, global humanities, and their multifaceted and very disturbing degree of um, transdisciplinarity fascinates me. I know what you're saying, oh, again, hippies, again, fantasizing. So I'm going to give you some very serious examples um, to prove to you that this is not only possible, it is already happening. First of all, the proliferation of the studies areas that I mentioned before has seen some great accelerations of late. So the studies areas are continuing to grow. It's like mushrooms, they call, it's viral. So after the end of the Cold War, we get emergence of centers for conflict and peace studies. We have a very brilliant, brilliant one here in Utrecht. Peace and war emerge as great research topics. Humanitarian man management, human rights centers, trauma and reconciliation studies. My favorite, death studies, is up and running. And I thought it was my last one, but recently I discovered FET studies. And I bet you that as we speak, more studies areas are coming up. Check the studies and measure the incredible vitality of a field that is wrongly represented as actually being in crisis. If this is a crisis, it's what the French call une crise de croissance. We are doing extremely well. I would not go with Martha Nussbaum and actually bank on a return of ethics and transcendental reasons and moral philosophy as the future of our field. I completely concur with what Wendy Brown said this morning. If we bank on ethics, we're shooting ourselves on the foot. We need to go back to the multiple discursive resources of the field as a whole. So environmental humanities are the great winners. The, the German government has invested 7 million euros in a project called the Anthropocene that is actually a big experiment between arts, new media, literature, eco-criticism, environmental history, human rights, philosophy, a lot of Deleuze, a lot of Guattari, a lot of other ones as well. Anthropocene humanities experimenting with methodologies and thought processes, experimenting with new terminologies by which we can come to terms with a post-anthropocentric term, which is the effect of the science and technology under advanced capitalism, and there's a lot of political stuff here that we can talk about, but I don't have the time. So the environmental Anthropocene is one of them. The second example I want to give you comes from Utrecht. It's something I am really very proud of, and I quote it extensively in the book. Utrecht is one of the first universities that has adopted what they call the One Health Initiative. And the One Health Initiative translates in a chair that combines in the same chair veterinary science and human medicine. 
and human and animal health in one chair. One health initiative, I owe this to Anton Pipers, my colleague in the veterinary science department, because a great deal of our health problems today are shared. Pandemics, but also other um, problems are very shared with the, the other, the, the, the traditional other of our species. So this gives animal studies a very interesting twist. Um, and the, it, for them, post-anthropocentric discursive practices are completely normal. So what is the problem of not assuming the centrality and uniqueness of anthropos? Of course, uh, it's just, it just goes by itself that you look at these problems as um, interconnected. The third example is global, it's complicated, is the digital humanities, which is emerging almost as a corporation of its own, complicated politically, very richly endowed, um, but within that, the potential to redefine at least um, some elements of what we call digital citizenship, new forms of mediated cultural and political participation. So you see these things are happening. It's not future studies in the sense of complete fantasy world, but more picking out of the complex contemporary landscape elements, symptoms of the great vitality, but also the great courage of a field that dares to innovate and dare to emerge. We can only survive if we show the willingness, the courage, the theoretical uh, uh, responsibility to embrace these changes and embrace them on the strength of the contradictions and the internal fractures, aiming not at a new synthesis, not at an agreement, but a multiversity that looks like the world that we're in, fast moving, confusing, but at the end of it all, inevitably fascinating, and what an exciting time to try to be a thinking humanoid of the female species. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie, for that. Um, I have one comment and one very serious question. Um, the comment is that where I grew up, the vets treated the people and the doctors treated the animals. And I think that's actually true in most of the world. And in that regard, of course, it was seen as a sign of immense wealth when you escaped that particular conjoining. Um, so it's just something to, that is to say, when you actually got to have a human doctor who was not also a vet, and when the animals got out of the house and the people got to be in it alone and so forth. So I... I I very much take your point about anthropocentrism, but I also wonder if we aren't from the pos position of the global north, sometimes still accidentally, inadvertently, um, romanticizing or idealizing something. Um, well, let me put it a different way. I wonder if we still aren't simply recovering from ourselves um, at the center of the empire rather than actually undoing imperial conceits. But here's the more serious question. Because um, <laughs> that was just... <laughs> well, yeah, it was just to, to reflect on. I don't, I don't know if we have an answer for that. But the more serious question is this. The various kinds of studies that you see as the future of the humanities and that many of us can get excited about, and some we get more excited about than others, and some we worry about more than others, I wonder what your thoughts are on an old question about what kind of, as it were, classical training one requires to be able to do the kind of thinking that you are also celebrating at the frontiers of 21st and 22nd century thought. And what I mean by that is so many of us over the years who've been involved in critical race theory and feminist theory and queer theory and so forth have found ourselves up against a dilemma in which we came out of a, 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 a disciplinary formation that allowed us to do certain kinds of critical work on that formation and then find ourselves with students who are only doing the critical work don't have the formation, and we find something missing. And what we find missing is obviously not the um, conserving moments of global inequalities and exclusions, <laughs> but rather what we find missing is some of that um, training, 
some of those languages, some of those literatures, some of those knowledges, and especially those historical knowledges and historical formations. So my question here is really for you just to reflect for us as a great enthusiast of programs that I'm sometimes a little bit more hesitant about embracing. Um, how, how do you address that particular issue? Do you, do you imagine a future in which there is nothing but these interdisciplinary studies programs and, and, and intelligence and wisdom and thoughtfulness and reflection and curiosity are actually formed through those programs or in which there are roads into them that have some of the kinds of training and some of the kinds of formations and languages and literatures that, that we often find missing even now in the interdisciplinary studies programs? What a fantastic question. I'm about to commit suicide. Um, uh, do I, can I just try, attempt to come to terms with it? Okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, it's a very multi-layered question that resonates with your early article on uh, the impossibility of women's studies and the epistemological grounding of these studies areas. Uh, but let me take a step back. Um, I do not see the proliferation of the studies areas in between the disciplines, what James Chandler calls critical interdisciplinarity, as only a sign of uh, vitality. It is also a sign of the crisis of the disciplines themselves. And if philosophy had accepted the radical generation that we are, it would be a very different discipline today and we would be very different thinkers probably ourselves. It's, it's two faceted, it's both a symptom of a crisis and uh, an expression of great vitality. What I find interesting about the proliferation is how it fits into the perverse post-anthropocentrism of advanced capitalism and what um, Melinda Cooper co calls uh, life as surplus and the extent to which is knowledge about life itself that constitutes capital today and as your work among others uh, illustrates quite clearly. We are in cognitive capitalism. What really matters is understanding the codes of all that lives all species and all categorical differences notwithstanding. And I think this is where um, one of the great originating forces of this thinking, Donna Haraway, really hits on something uh, completely right. It begins with, with Monsanto and the seeds. It goes on with all of the sheep. It becomes the human genome project. If I understood President Obama, we have just launched the brain program. So, so networking, extended mind, networked selves, what Deleuze and Guattari call transversal assemblages is the political logic of knowledge production in advanced capitalism. And all of us are all part of that. And thank God, because that way we can gain a life. But how complicated it is to make a difference within cognitive capitalism between differences that are liberating and differences that are as Donna Haraway puts it, pillars of world historical systems of domination. So there is a sense in which the proliferation of the studies areas has to do with the privatization of research. The university has missed many boats when it comes to actually grabbing on, holding on to fundamental research. We don't control IT. We barely control biogenetics. And we missed out on a great deal of the the brain is borderline with the robotics industry. The three people that design the third millennium, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, are all college dropouts. You know, we don't have a great deal to go with. And so there is a sense in which the, the university has let go or has not been able to hold on to knowledge production because capitalism has gone cognitive. Because the production, understanding the codes of all that lives, digital logarithms and biogenetic is what counts. Uh, as capital, and a lot of our colleagues in the out of, and Minard and I have different opinions on it, they, are, they own companies. When they finish teaching, they cross the border and they, they go to their company and they patent vaccines and great discoveries which university values because it generates money and prestige and high ranking. We cannot possibly do that in the humanities, but we have the studies areas, and as if we were running after the fragments of knowledge production subsumed by advanced capitalism with our own critical edge. And, and I think that's uh, sometimes I think it's a bit pathetic. Sometimes I think it's um, all we can do. The question of the pedagogics, how would we teach this? What are the foundations of this is a very complex one. And it is true that our generation 
we were all trained in the disciplines. I, I am just continental philosophy, history of philosophy, that's what I know. And we are the generation that contributed to the proliferation of studies areas. And I think we need to map probably more carefully our relationship to the disciplines. Historians somehow, you always remain historians. What is it with you? You never really draw back. Philosophy has a long tradition of ejecting people and you become a philosopher of the outside. So if you're Socrates, they invite you to kill yourself because actually it would be easier. And so there is a tradition of expulsion in that discipline. But there are disciplines that kind of hold a seductive power that is quite, uh, uh, so I think we need a mapping of that. All I can see uh, is the necessity of providing solid and not contingent foundations. I see the necessity of what Foucault taught us about the genealogy of certain ideas. I am the honorary granny of a wonderful four-year-old who genuinely believes that Hercules is a Walt Disney character. And, and, and I am now trying to get sort of little synopsis of you know, um, a Roman and Greek mythology, trying to teach him that there are other ways in which um, these ideas have been uh, kind of produced and they come from elsewhere. So the idea of an archaeology of knowledge that would actually start from what we have, technological mediation, mediocracy, multi-layeredness, of, of reinterpretation of text, but try to reconnect it back to what counts as the discursive power of our culture, the classics in all of their complexities. If it is any help, I had exactly this conversation with my colleagues at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who said, our youth, they don't read Confucius anymore. They don't know the classics. What are you going to do about this? I'm going to send you Fritz van Ostrom, and he's going to explain to you <laughs> what to do. Uh, but my more philosophical answer would be an archaeology of knowledge working backwards from what we have and in providing that backward-looking map, obviously accepting the differences. We would not read the human and the humanities and the classics in a uniform manner. The multiversity has to accept the pluriformity of possible readings, even of the grand tradition, but I don't think we can do without the grand tradition. In that sense, I share your concern completely. Kind of almost answered, but not quite. Well, very well, thank you very much. That was it. Great. <laughs>Nearly 225 years ago today, the young Friedrich Schiller, the new professor of history at the University of Jena, held his inaugural lecture. And the lecture hall was packed. And on the stairs and in the streets, several hundreds of students were fighting to get in. They caused a commotion, and it was decided to move the lecture to the large, largest auditorium of the city, after which Schiller preceded by a huge procession of audience members, walked to the new hall. To my knowledge, the U University of Utrecht has never known such an enthusiastic student audience for any inaugural lecture. Now, you're all familiar with Schiller as the German poet and playwright, who was also a good friend of Goethe's and who suffered from the classic, the classic fate of the 19th century poet, Das from galloping consumption. Friedrich Schiller was not just anybody. Still, he was not much to look at. His hair was always disheveled, and he was usually sloppily dressed, which provoked raised eyebrows in his more serious colleagues. Schiller's unconventional appearance obviously does not explain why the students climbed the street lamps in order to catch a glimpse of his passing by. When Schiller holds his lecture on the 26th of May of 1789, entitled, Why Should We Study World History Today? He is not yet 30 years old. But he is already a German superstar. The German youth are wild about his plays and cannot get enough of his poetry. And when in May 1789, Schiller starts his professorship six weeks before the outbreak of the French Revolution, only a few students have been able to see him in the flesh, but they know the, the work of the wandering, awkward, but gifted politically and literarily poet and writer who promise to show them the way to the realm of the freedom. Why do I bother you with this? The reason is very simple. Schiller's lecture 
did not only command interest in his own time, it still has a lot to teach us today. Schiller treats a large issue that still occupies many of us. What is the purpose of the university? And this is the very question I want to discuss with you at the end of the first conference day. And I ask you for 45 minutes of your patience. I only have 25. <laughs> in 1789, Schiller divided his jubilant audience in two parts. On one hand, the university is populated by what he called the Brotgeleerte, careerists, both students and professors who never doubt what they have to learn or to teach, who are not interested in the question of how their discipline is connected to that of others, and who get irritated when such questions are raised. These are people who detest the, the very idea of extra work. The only thing that matters to them is meeting the requirements with as little effort as possible. And once they have tenure, they're usually dead set against any innovation, if only because of the work it entails. In other words, they are unwilling to serve scholarship. They only want to profit by it in money and most of all in appreciation. They are, as Sheila described them, unquestioning people with a slavish morality who just happen to have found themselves in the realm of freedom by accident. <laughs> the opposite of the Broodgeleerte is the philosophische Kopf, the generous and creative soul constantly in search of new knowledge. This kind of scholar first wishes to understand the world and how the different disciplines studying the world are interconnected for the relationship between things are the ultimate aim of science. This type of student or professor understands that success in scholarship is rare because we, have, we, we constantly have to find out our way out of dead end roads. The philosophische Kopf is magnanimous and can handle criticism because he knows what we are ultimately searching for. We are, that, we are searching for the truth together. He experiences the company of superior minds as a challenge, while it makes the Broodgeleerte extremely uncomfortable. Obviously, the philosophical cop also needs his daily bread, and he likes his career, and he also likes financial gain, but they are not what his position at the university is all about. What drives these free spirits is the rare but all-encompassing joy when a scientific or scholarly problem for one moment seems to have been solved forever. Never. <laughs> Today, Schiller's university is more recognizable than ever. And all of you, as you are sitting here, can effortlessly find examples of this academic ideal types everywhere. I can ask everybody, name five of the Broodgeleerte and you'll find them easily. Philosophic Cup is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> but is that not part of a much larger problem? Even more often today, the public concludes that science is not able to supply clear and unambiguous answers to large social problems. Whether this concerns climate change, the Mexican flu, or dramatically raising costs of healthcare. Science appears to be unable to, to supply definitive solutions, but only supplies us with alternatives. And this obstinate practice contrasts strongly with the image of science. Many prominent scientists, documentary makers, and science, and science journalists distribute even today. Taken, for instance, in this country, the Anthony van Leeuwenhoek Clinic, that only this summer was in the framework of a backing campaign promise for the umpteenth time, by the way, that cancer would become a chronic disease within the next 10 years, if only we kept donating. The science supplements of the, news, news, of the newspapers therefore concentrate on the great inventions, but leave the much larger number of flagrant failures systematically underexposed. More things are amiss. Science appears to be an easy ploy for rapid economic gain, and what is worse, it has become completely dependent upon a speculative economy, characterized by rapid successive bubbles and crashes. Researchers have to involve industrial partners in their work. We call this acquisition of external funding, and it looks nice. 
To become su successful at it, we have to play our part in the games of the competitive economy. And the top sector policy of the Dutch government is the perverse culmination of this system. Money intended for pure scientific research is taken away to be spent in collaboration with businesses for direct applicable, directly applicable knowledge. New research can always be, be funded as long as scientists do what the industry demands. Conformism, rivalry, opportunism, and lack of flexibility are the characteristics of this system. And we effortly, effort, effortlessly recognize the mindset of Schiele's Broodgeleerte. Are the frequent instances of academic fraud these days merely accidental? Or are they the symptom of the systematic failure of our universities? Is our goal still science and the exploration of the limits of our knowledge? Uh, or is our overproduction of research proposal nothing more than a gigantic but radically faultily adjusted job machine? Why? Because only the half of the several thousands of Utrecht postgraduate students, the majority of whom is not working in science, in science but is executing test research on behalf of businesses, can continue as, as a postdoc at best. But after that, we consign them to the dung heap of history because the number of tender jobs at the university is falling. Why are we being dictated by university rankings and impact factors of articles? In short, why does the university aim for quantity and not for quality? I would say, are we not by now entitled to a truly durable university? In its realization, I think Schiele's ideal type, the Philosophische Kopf, can be of help. In the new durable university, good research is not automatically synonymous with many publications. We are no longer trying to get the better of our colleagues with the number of postgraduate students we have successfully supervised. In that university, research is not triggered uh, by economic interests of industrial powers, but by social questions to be solved in service to the community. Most of all, the researchers working there are trained in thinking beyond particular concerns. They are striving to get a grip on the larger picture. Is the fracking expert investigating shale gas drilling for turning his back on the nasty consequences, not the broodgeleerte, and is the researcher who takes the consequences into account naturally not the philosophische cop? We must strive for a university that does not advertise itself as a successful incubator of one-dimensional <laughs> researchers, but as a civitas academica, where philosophische köpfe are schooled, who can function as the core of a highly qualified, mentally flexible, and socially useful professional workforce. That also means, ladies and gentlemen, that education has to be reinstated in its place of honor at the university, because we want to educate all around intellectuals. Moreover, we must be willing to admit that the growth of knowledge does not automatically engender progress, but primarily fundamental uncertainty. We do not know what the future will look like, but it's our task to keep trying to shape that future on the road to what Schiller called the higher planes of humanity. I don't know if it's your humanity, Rosie, but we have to discuss yeah. that later. Um, <laughs> where should this durable university start? History of scientific practice and of philosophy of science are indispensable to its formation. Not only to explain where we have come from and where we are now, but especially to warn future generations of the pitfalls of scientific practice and to make them immune as possible to the myths of the infallible knowledge and the incorruptible high priest ac accumulating that knowledge. And I think especially the history of science, and that's an oratio pro domo, so just, you can now just stop listening for about two minutes. But the history of science, I think that is very useful. And it has made it us clear that behind the spotless battlements of the ivory tower of the university, the real world of science looks remarkably more disorganized. Among themselves, 
scientists turn out to disagree strongly about questions and problems, and they belong to different camps and schools. Scientific practice is eventually nothing more and nothing less than a noisy marketplace where obscurity, flagrant mistakes, vulgar quarrels, fraud, but also accident and disappointment induce creativity, innovation, and democratic counterpower. Now, it would be natural to expect the salvation of your future university from the humanities fac faculty. For one might to expect that at least there, the philosophische Köpfe are produced by the dozen. But this is far from true. The humanities faculty has also been corrupted. It's an interesting hypothesis that in the 1970s, corrupted started not only in the sciences and not only in the social sciences, but also here in the humanities. In any case, from that time on, the academic humanities elite started a remarkable process of social abdication. In doing so, they actually gave substance to their doubts and as regards the national and civic educational mission of which they themselves were the product. This mission was the education of teachers, civil servants, and intellectuals well-versed in what the humanities has always been the core of university education, reading, writing, logic, rhetoric, speaking, the basic elements of the original trivium. It may go too far to qualify this abandonment of society as a modern version of Julien Benda's Trahison des Clairs, but there are some very striking similarities. This social abdication took two forms, and together they have struck at the very roots of the social usefulness of the humanities faculty. For a very large part, I think we have ourselves to blame for the present day crisis in the humanities. As from the 1970s, more and more voices were raised that the teacher's profession should not be considered the graduate's normal and natural destination. Were, they not, were the graduates not suitable to fulfill all kinds of positions? Those other professional opportunities had been always there, but from now on, it was considered and in good taste to paint the teacher's profession as an ideal option for failures and twerps. And that has continued, continued until today. And in the debates surrounding the introduction of the two-tier structure for university education around 1980, this development reached its conclusion and the teacher's profession definitely disappeared from the humanities perspective. And the other manifestation of the social abdication of the humanities elite is the growing emphasis on research. This process did not only take place in the sciences and social sciences, but also in the humanities. Research, as of old, was indeed also conducted in the traditional humanities faculty. But it had a closer connection to the individual scholar and was usually intimately linked to education. And the research production was modest. But the enormous growth of the scholarly staff in the humanities as a result of the increasing demand for education also automatically led to a dramatic growth of research capacity. And both internal university developments and the pressure from new external scientific organizations ensured that research became ever more encompassing and now completely dominates the life of professors and lecturers at the humanities faculties. If before they were primarily responsible for education, now the emphasis lies on the supervision of large groups of postgraduate students and postdocs, and the prestige is synonymous with the magnitude of that task. It is rather strange that questions as to the use of all this humanities research, and more abstractly, as to the amount of research a civilized society actually needs are hardly ever debated. I will not argue that the research conducted today is of low value. On the contrary, I'm absolutely convinced that the quality of humanities research in the last decades has increased dramatically. But there are, in fact, 
very few takers for our research. Obviously, a part of it has a direct social function, but there is no natural limit. Why should we want to know, to begin at home, that around 1800, the balance between the city and the country in the Netherlands was completely different and shifted not to the city but to the country. And that on the basis of that, we can just doubt the accepted general route to modernity that is normal in Europe. What's the use of that? It was fun researching it, but what's the use? And the net effect of the above sketch developments, the discrediting of the teacher's profession, and the championing of, of research is that the humanities faculties, which up to then had fulfilled a central function in society, have since fallen victim um, uh, to a similar system failure of which the sciences and the social sciences fell victim to, resulting in marginalization. The number of scholarly publications has become so huge that even the pretense that we are keeping up with developments in our field has become hollow by definition. Add to that the large part of our research results that is only relevant to a very tiny group of colleagues. And to cleanse our guilty, our guilty conscience in this respect, we have given the concept of valorization a very unsavory meaning. In our daily practice, what does valorization actually mean? That we can tell ourselves our research is relevant because we have, after having shamelessly promoted ourselves, been able to shine for a full two minutes and 17 seconds on an evening night uh, talk show. And this, while the social effect of a zero education in reading, writing, thinking, and speaking for future teachers and a highly qualified professional population has a multiplier effect against which any appearance in any talk show is completely useless. Admittedly, the importance of ac academic education has been emphasized increasingly over the last decade. And we have even, even developed policies in order to stimulate this. But also the idea of a larger role for the university in the training of teachers, I must say, that has gained some support. But all of this does not amount to more than half-hearted efforts. As long as we keep applying the model of the research university, which even in the United States, where this idea was most successfully implemented and where it has done so much harm, as long as we continue to do so, we continue to force professors and lecturers into an impossible split and the consequences of which are predictable. Whoever wishes to interpret my argument as a plea for the abolition of research has proven himself an unwilling listener. Research remains a crucial task of the university, but it is absolutely essential to consider the very hard question of how much humanities research a society needs, and more specifically, a plea for reflection on the balance between education and research. I, for one, know that the future humanities faculty will be an education faculty, or it will not be at all. And what does that education consist of? It's of little use to formulate peremptory demands here in three minutes. But I'm convinced that the triad, grammar, logic, and rhetoric must form the core of humanities education, although it seems to be wise also in the view of the spectacular developments in UE humanities to add subjects uh, such as mathematics and of course um, the visual arts, uh, the visual and media skills. But that's not all. The university also supplies education specialized to certain disciplines. For 150 years, this was done within the framework of civic education and national consciousness because society was convinced that the mental toolkit of every citizen should be equipped with that. Today, that toolkit should be updated. And for my discipline, I'm sorry, it's history, it's not very hard to, to formulate themes to which all my colleagues, regardless of their specialization in time and theme, can contribute. I name a few. Globalization and nation building. 
citizenship and democracy, enlightenment, modernity and postmodernity, the tension between nature and culture, and the problem of religion and state building, and we can continue forever. And any discipline can fill this mental toolkit in its own and yet socially useful way. The question is not whether a fully fledged humanities faculty can do without Portuguese or Norse or whatever discipline, but whether, whether it offers sound mental tools established in and directly ensuing from the accretion of academic capacity, exactly those three I uh, mentioned to you from the trivium. If we would arrange the new academic study of humanities according to such a scheme, education would intensify. The teacher's profession would be reinstated as a viable profession for the humanities graduate. Academic education and the university professor would again be attributed with the central position they deserve. And finally, research would be limited and concentrated in a modest sector of researchers uh, selected for their very high quality. When all of this is accomplished, there is a fair chance that the humanities will again find their connection to society. Now I fully realize that it's too easy to blame the university alone for the problems I've discussed. And with that point, I want to end. A society that thinks as a university is a factory in which the production of, of ever-growing numbers of graduates automatically justifies the ever-falling expense price per unit, should not be surprised to have delivered to it instead of first-rate philosophische Köpfe, second-rate Brotgeleerte. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are on the verge of great and very necessary changes. We do not have yet a blueprint for a new durable university. But I think discussions like these today are amassing sufficient material to start a very fruitful discussion about the future. We have work to do. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Meinhardt. Uh, my name is Kirsten Pols. I'm a PhD here uh, at the University of Utrecht. Um, and I um, agree with you completely. Uh, my experience in my teacher education is that all the students who did a teacher's degree did this because they failed to get a better job. That was the most, um, uh, including myself at the start, actually. Um, but um, my question is, what actually do you think is the impact of having teachers in front of uh, pupils who stand there and teach, not because they feel a vocation to teach, but they, because they feel they, haven't, they didn't have what it takes to get a PhD position. And um, my second question is about the, the, the triad. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that is the right means to address the most important question in education, namely teaching pupils what it means to be human. Um, I, I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit about what do you think the role of the triad is in teaching children what it means to be human? Um, as to your first question, the way you frame and phrase it, of course it will be absolutely impossible to ever reinstate uh, the, the teacher's profession to a higher level and also a higher social level because you start just to interpret it as something second best. Um, my great example in this case is of course the past, but the past of course is never very attractive, so we're not going to discuss the past. But if you take for instance um, the educational situation in Finland, which is, is a, uh, a, very, a country very close to us, which in very many is very, uh, respects is very similar. There even just the um, kindergarten uh, teachers are educated at the, U at the U university. And the most interesting, they get not paid so very highly as they are paid here, but the respect for the teacher profession is much higher there. I don't have very simple solutions. But I think it will take time. 
it will be very difficult, but we have to do it because we are responsible for a secondary school system which is producing children which are not getting what they deserve to get. That is our basic problem. And our students at the university, that's the other the issue, that's the one directly connected, they do not get the education they deserve. I'm not talking about their capacities. Of course, we can, we, we can talk on very long about just the limited capacity of the students, but if they have limited capacities, it's not because the secondary school system is completely a system failure. So I think these things are connected. That's about your first question. That's not a complete answer. answer, it's not the full answer, but at least we can start from there. Um, about the trivium, of course, that is a little bit of a boutade, but again, but, 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 no, but the basic issue is, what is it all be about? What is it about being an intellectual? You are able to read, you are able to write, you are able to, uh, to reason, and you, are, uh, and you are able to, I, I, I forgot about, about the other one, but that is the most important thing. And therefore I added a, a, a little bit of mathematics and of course media skills, visual skills. That's modern system. But that, we don't have to teach our students much more than that. If they are able to do that very, very well, they are, able to, they are able to analyze pictures, they are able to analyze just, um, uh, text, they are able to, to, to produce a serious text themselves, and that, in most cases, still is a very viable practice, if you're able to do that. Hi, um, Hayo Tabant, also here from Utrecht um, University. So weighing on the, in on that discussion, I uh, totally agree with you that teaching should be the core uh, business of the, of the university as it always uh, been throughout history. Um, right now, in our department, we see that about 20 to 25 percent of the teaching is actually done by volunteers. Uh, that means um, PhD students and postdocs or um, people who have a grant that uh, basically do teaching uh, for re uh, resume building or because they just like it. Um, from the other part, the, 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 the teaching that is done by faculty members spends way more time uh, for teach in, in, in their teaching than they get, gr um, get granted, basically. So this fundamental problem of um, the disrespect for um, for the profession of teaching is actually at work in the university. That's where it starts. <laughs> so how do we change this? How, how can we make the dean give us more time for teaching and um, pay the teachers, not even a reasonable set, but at least pay them something? Hold them captive for three months, I would say. But, uh, <laughs> but, but of course, that's I'm here for a half hour this morning. <laughs> but, no, but this is, a, you, you have touched on one of the basic issues. But the point is that if we have take a look, and I don't have the figures uh, precisely in my head, but if you take a look at the numbers of enrollments in university and the number uh, and the amount of money spent on the university, that is an ever widening gap. Now, how do, and that's the reason why we have volunteers, why we have just PhD students, why we have whatever kind of people just doing the teaching and if the faculty members are supervising the graduate students. There, there are very simple solutions, but very, but very unattractive solutions. The first, of course, is um, we force the government to spend much more. Uh, if we listen to this, our provost this morning, he was very, uh, very reluctant in uh, hoping that we would ever get that kind of money. If that's the case, then we have to do something else. We have to reduce the number of enrollments because we cannot raise enough students to this required level that society needs. That is not very attractive, but it's the only possibility. Or the other possibility is you raise just the, um, uh, the, the, the college fees. That's also a possibility of a mixture of the two. But you have to do something. If we continue this way, we are going to continue to destroy the mental and intellectual capacities of complete generations. And we have to do something. 
And that is not in, 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 that is, is, uh, keeping this, the dean captive because most deans, as far as I know them, they struggle day and night to make ends meet because what can they do? The only solution for the kids, a kind of singing like this, is never become a dean. Uh, because <laughs> it, it is a very unattractive just, um, 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 job at this day. But we have to do something. And it's not me, it's just me, it's you, it is all of us who have to do something. Because otherwise the system will continue, no problem. Because nobody is complaining. The, the, the government is not complaining, and in most cases um, the, the, um, the, um, the union of universities is not complaining. Uh, we are doing our best, that's what they're telling us all the time. They're doing our best, their best, but that's not enough. That's the real issue. So would it be a good moment to say until here and no, no further and organize ourselves or something? Uh, no. Because, I mean, I, 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 I know in my department there's, a, there's a, um, actually a research master, which is one of the excellent masters and whatever. So they have four core courses. The teachers are being paid for that. All the other courses, that means more than half of the curriculum uh, is, is taught basically on the basis of um, uh, by volunteers. So if all teachers would say, okay, until here are no father, the program cannot exist. If everybody would organize and do that, you have a point. But for some reason... We need, um, we actually need to thank you at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we have um, I wanted to um, pick up one question over to Paul, actually, because it was uh, it emerged after Rosie about um, the interdisciplinary and the training. I'd like to hear from that. And if you're with your patients, we can take maybe two or three other questions after that. Uh, okay, well, I think answering that question depends on what levels we're talking about, really. Um, obviously, there are particular questions or significance of that question in the context of a liberal arts conversation we're having this morning. I think in, in our country, people begin to specialize in their penultimate year of secondary school. So by the time they arrive in the university, they've already been acquainted with some basic um, um, you know, disciplinary geom geometry. They know where the canonical markers are. So I'm not, I'm not so worried about having to teach that over again. I'm much more concerned about how one begins to teach a different relationship with that body of knowledge. And uh, I mean, again, I, you know, I, I suppose I think, I think they need that familiarity, but when they come in, they mostly have it. And one of the problems we face is that we end up teaching it over and over again. And I think that's, that's to be avoided. I don't actually think I totally agree with Rosie's idea about the proliferating subject areas. I, I don't, um, I see the future of our research culture, and I agree actually about many of the things that have been said about its essentially destructive um, impact on institutional life. I see the future of that research um, culture as being one which is based on very fluid, very multidisciplinary problem focused teams across uh, faculty divisions that we would have had. And, and I try not to speak about interdisciplinarity because I know that it raises flags for people uh, for whom inter is nowhere, actually. I'd rather talk about multidisciplinarity, and I think that that's a real, that's a real prospect, particularly if we move to a research culture which is much more team-based. I mean, I want to sit down and talk to people who are interested in water, who have different, you know, who might have a legal, um, who know more about the law of the sea than I do, or who, who are people who are hydrologists, or historians of ports, I want, or, or, or people who, who do the science of all of this with regard to climate change, I use that as an, as an example. I think we're going to have to do that. And, and actually maybe that's one small stimulus from certain versions of the corporate culture, not the sort of fantasy 1950s business school version that we're being <laughs> beaten over the head with at the moment, where, where I think that there are, in some creative spaces, arrangements like that that are people are be, being gradually habituated to. Thank you. Sure. I have a question for Professor Meinhardt. Um, if you are seriously suggesting, and I hope you're not seriously suggesting this, but that university professors no longer do research 
and only teach what will be the quality of the education that students will be getting in the ro long run? That is not my intention. No, it never was my intention. And I, if I remember it well, I even try to tell that to my audience, that I do not hate research. I do not think that research is bad for the university, not at all. It is, my issue is about just the overriding importance attached to the university at this stage and the balance between uh, with, um, uh, teaching and research. And that, I think, is seriously jeopardized in the last decade, maybe f 15 years, depending on where you are and w what your locations are and, but, uh, and what is the money av uh, available to you, your, your university. But that is my issue. Not, um, I think every professor, every university teacher should, should conduct at least some research. Yesterday, uh, it was in the Volkswagen newspaper, there was a beautiful article, one article a year. Of course, this is just as stupid as five articles a year, but the idea is very clear. Please take away just that obligation of producing so many articles. Work on an article for two years and then uh, publish it and be happy. And then at least you have solved the issue for three months, maybe not for... for also an excellent opportunity for a dean to say, well, I won't give you any research time anymore. You'll be teaching all the time, which is factually what the junior staff is doing at the moment. They're teaching their brains out or their butts I'm, off or whatever you want to <laughs> call it. But I'm, I fully agree. I fully agree. It is, it, it is the balance that is totally and completely wrong. The only thing that I want to say is that it's too simple is to blame it on the dean, because the dean has, especially in the humanities, fact, have to make, end, make ends meet, and he is, he is not getting the amount of money for the enormous growth of the number of students. That's the basic issue. And in the end, that's a social issue. Um, and we can solve that in many ways, but we have to solve it. That's the only thing I want to stress. So we're coming back to Jordan. So I hope you're feeling better. Um, <laughs> after this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I am from uh, the campus Orléon, Julien Hafmans, which is an uh, outside of the university researching science and universities. I'm really asking myself in, in uh, following up this gentleman um, and also because of another research we did on uh, being too smart for the uh, no, whatever. Um, if education and research finds itself in an exploitative system and a dysfunctioning system, I ask myself, where is the space to do something about it, if not here and now? And in following up his comment. So uh, please make some space to discuss what to do instead of how to talk about it. We, we have just started a movement science in transition, the, the, the provost made, made a small reference to it this morning. My only fear is, of course, that it will get some attention because it's always nice, the, uh, professors of 63 who are revolting, that's, that, that, that's a great story. But <laughs> the point is, of course, that um, you are up against enormous issues and enormous difficulties. But uh, at least, just like uh, four small boys, because we are four of us, we have committed ourselves that we are going, and going on until the end, because we want something to change. But, and we have ideas. And, and, but um, it's not enough to have ideas. You, you have to be versatile in politics as well. And that is what we will have to do in just the near future. And you have to organize the people. And you have to organize the people. But, you see, the most important, in Flan uh, uh, am I allowed? Because, of course, I can talk for hours about things like this. Uh, <laughs> you, you, can have, you can take one, more, one or two more sentences. Okay. In Flanders, they did it with, just with the humanities and the social sciences. I think what is hopeful in our case, but that is ac that's accidental, that it is all of the, of the university. It's all, it, it also includes the medical faculty. It also includes uh, parts of this, the, um, the, the sciences faculty. So there is a bit of hope, but just a bit of hope. Last question for John. Let's end together. Yeah. <laughs> I think Greg has one. Greg, do you want to? Yeah, no, Wendy's. Okay. 
All right, I promise not to talk so much, but um, I actually agree with you 98% that, that the emphasis on research is out of control and has actually made much of academia quite stupid, quite narrow, quite professionalized, preoccupied with its signification vis-a-vis -vis other researchers, doing largely pointless research, et cetera. But it's not as if it's just a choice. <laughs> It is driven by a system of recognition and metrics that are now worse than ever. But here's the specter I wanted to place before you. I think your desire to cut off most university research, except for those who really have something original or talented or particularly passionate or curious to pursue, and return us to teaching, is very, very, very likely the future. It's the online education future. It's the dismantling of public education future. It's the adjunct future. It's the future of a staff of teachers, and I think this is what Shanti is responding to, who do nothing but teach, and a very reduced, compressed, shrunk layer of researchers. And I don't think that um, the selection for those two categories would be the one that you would actually want. So my, I, I'm not criticizing you for that, because I actually do think that, the, that, that most faculty have their heads in the sand about what our future is, even as our graduate programs are going out from under us in the US, even as, as the, 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 the literal spaces in Europe and the US for new PhDs are just vanishing by the, by the minute and by the year. So I do think the future you're painting is, in some ways, commensurate I mean, the future you say you want is in some ways commensurate with the future that we have before us, only I don't think you want us to go down the particularly dark path that we're headed down. So I just want your thoughts on that. No, but that's, you're perfectly right that that is a very big danger. Because, very simply, I do not believe that much in the intrinsic value of the, of the humanities. But I do believe in the intrinsic value of the humanities teachers, who is, in, who is inspiring students just to discuss those values and just to, by acting as an example, but that doesn't mean that you can have a great internet lecture. There's nothing wrong with an internet lecture, but you need to have a working group or a seminar, even with first year students, to, to supplement that and to create. And that is something that we really should, should to try to um, keep for the very long future. But it, doing nothing, I think, is even worse. So um, at this point, um, we're going to close. I, I want to put out a, a, a thought and also an advertisement. The advertisement is the panel tomorrow morning is on new knowledge on a digital and sustainable future. So it directly connects with many of these issues. I want to give you an image just to imagine a status shift of remarkable sort. Imagine if the sessional lecturers were paid more than the research faculty. Right? Imagine if we said, research faculty are fine, they should get, have a good wage, but the people who are doing that heavy lifting in the teaching, we think they're doing something more important in society, and they should be rewarded more in the university budget than the researchers in the humanities, just as, a, as an image. And on that, um, completely heretical thought. <laughs> um, uh, I want to say thank you to the whole panel. This has been a really great discussion. And there's, uh, and Rosie's got, um, oh, so, so the other thing to say is, I think we have drinks. Indeed, drinks, uh, I'm switching heads here. Yes. Uh, the presence for the speakers, and see you at 9.30 in a different location tomorrow. I'm brain dead, but what a day. Thank you all.